Have you ever wondered what Battlestar Galactica has to do with leadership? That's what we'll talk about today. When you become a leader, you give up the right to think about yourself. Gerald Brooks. Today we're going to talk about Battlestar Galactica. Now this show is a little bit older, but there are two versions of the show. One that happened back in the 70s and the more recent one that happened in 2004 to 2009. Both of them follow a similar pattern, a little bit different. Certainly the one in 2004 is a lot more gritty, more realistic, but the storylines are the same. The gist goes that Earth is attacked by robots, and the robots in the 1970s version are shiny. You can tell who they are. You can tell what they are, and so you know right away when you see them. The 2004 version shows that essentially the Cylons became human looking. And so you couldn't tell them apart from the humans that existed. And they found a second earth. They were going to settle there. And that was going to then cause it so that they didn't have to do any fighting with each other. And then every so many years, they'd get together And they wouldn't destroy each other. They wouldn't wipe each other out. The TV show starts off with the Cylons getting together, meeting with their human counterparts to re-sign the armistice, and, well, they kill the ambassadors. This is not a spoiler alert. They attack the colonies of Cobalt, nearly wiping out all of humanity. So whatever ships were left, that was what they could escape with. Because the Cylons were so far more advanced than humans, they were able to take the networked spaceships and use them against the humans. They were dead in the water. They wouldn't fight the Cylons. So it was only the super old spaceships that never got to the point where they were networked were available to humans to escape this destruction. The story talks about Captain Adama, who was the captain of this older spaceship. And they were going to decommission the ship. It's going to be over with. No longer need this old, unnetworked spaceship. President Laura Roslin was on that ship. I think she was the Secretary of Education. She was way down the secession line. She was never meant to be in charge of anything. And she was interested in schools and teaching children and getting them better. So they were having a big ceremony to retire the ship. The ship was so unimportant at this point. All they got was the Secretary of Education. And then we have the son of Adama, who's the old captain, who's a flight pilot, good leader. His name is Apollo, not his real name. His real name is Leland. But then he fights back and then makes a stand against the Cylons, giving them and a few other ships to escape. So the episodes are always seen as writing how many human beings are left alive. So there's not many left. They are fleeing for their lives and every day hoping the Cylons don't find them to complete the process of wiping out all of humanity. In a bigger side of things, and the part that's important to us, is there are many different types of leadership that we have. President Roslin, who was now the president and no longer the secretary of education, never intended to be president. She had no aspirations of going that high, again, she was interested in education, finds herself in charge of the civilian government of what's left of humanity. And the leader of the ship, Adama, he was a tough military guy, someone who fought in old wars, knew the ship up and down, and he knew how to get things done. Then we have the son Apollo, who's a pragmatist, younger guy, learned in military school, younger ideas, and had more of an idealism to him. He wasn't the old, battled warrior. He had new, fresh ideas. But he was going to have to learn fast that war means giving up everything. So they come up with a coalition government so that basically Adama could be in charge of the survival of humanity, of the fleet of ships, figuring out how to escape the Cylons over and over again, because the Cylons now had huge military advantage over them. And Rosalind felt it was important that civilian leadership, even in a time of war, was important to guard the rights of the people who were left, 
look out for the well-being of everybody, as well as deciding what to do in fact of war. So that's where that split government comes from. Throughout the entire show, Apollo shows that he's a really amazing fighter. He's also an expert on constitutional constraints in the military. So that's how he went to school. You know, probably back in his father's day, the wars are everything. <laughs> you talk about your rights, you're going to end up dead. You know, and so I think about it, too. I grew up on a military base. That is how my father grew up. We were under the threat of Russia. My base was the most northern base in the United States. And so my dad always told me that if the Russians attacked, we were the very first response in the entire United States. When I asked him, how is Upper Michigan, which is nowhere close to Russia, the first response in the entire nation? And then he shows me the globe and you fly right over the top. This was an important base. And so this idea of existential war was always a big part of my growing up. And that's why I think maybe I like Battlestar Galactica so much, because this is what happens to them. They are fleeing every episode. And every episode, again, they're writing down how many civilians are left. If one of the ships blow up, we might have lost 40 people, 1,000 people, but they keep track so they know. Apollo and Adama are military men, but with different ideals. Adama is win at all cost. And Apollo is win in the service of humanity, not losing your humanity in the process of the war. And then Rosalind, of course, is the other side of it. Humans matter most. Us winning over the Cylons? Absolutely. But we have to care for people. So what they do is in order to evade the Cylons, they jump from place to place. They try to get away. They try to escape every time they can. And then there's another character in there named Starbuck. And there's an awesome meme on the internet with uh, the old Starbuck, the new Starbuck at Starbucks. You see, it's a cute joke, right? But she is a hotshot. She's an amazing warrior, pilot. She thinks of ideas to get them out of situations. So she is the fourth kind of leader where she leads by the seat of her pants. You know, that Han Solo, I'm going to figure out what to do next. She cares about people, but she cares about winning an awful lot too. So that show was one of my favorite shows when it talks about leadership in space. Four very different kinds of leaders. And then one bad guy, the secret is, there's someone on the ship, is a traitor to his entire species. Will humanity survive against this threat? So again, I love this show. Later on, there's a Pegasus that comes in as another ship they find that survived this attack. And the leader on there, there's no dissenting voices. She's a tyrant, but she's great at what she does. And she has the ability, because she's ruthless, to take out the Cylons entirely, wipe them off the entire universe or galaxy. And so then we get that other leader in here too. But this teasing of spies, of humans who are just trying to live, there comes out like a secret terror group inside the organization. And all these pulls between the various functions shows what it is. And I think what's nice about this show and nice about the show of leadership is essentially they're all right. Adama is right because we have to survive and we have to use time-tested methods in order to survive. Rosalind's right because we need a civilian government to look after people and make sure everyone's okay. You know, you don't want to have that situation where Adama is the last human being alive going down with his ship as he destroys the very last Cylon. That's no good either. Apollo's right. There's a constitution. We have to fight within legal limits. Starbuck is right. We have to give it everything we got. We have to give our heart out there to win what we can. And the leader of the Pegasus is right too. We have to do everything we can to remove the Cylon threat so humanity can reestablish itself. So I think that's what's really interesting about the show. There's no rights and wrongs in any of the opinions out there. There's better and best and maybe not so good. But I highly recommend listening to that show. But if you want to see leadership at its best, Battlestar Galactica is a really good way to go. In a humorous look at Battlestar Galactica, 
Some of the lessons learned, they said, were, one, make sure your antivirus is updated and your servers are patched. The whole human disaster happened because of hackable spaceships. Worry about AI. Sometimes it really is trying to kill you. Hmm. Okay. Don't outsource every job. Because the humans relied so much on the Cylons, this left us vulnerable to the enemies. The Cylons had to learn not to store all their backups in one location. If you're going to back up your computers, they should be federated across different locations in case something bad happens. So those were some funny lessons from Battlestar Galactica. Boy, now that I talk about this show, I'm going to watch this show all over again. What a great show. The other show that's not Star Trek that I like is The Expanse. This is a series of books written by two individuals that had a pseudonym for a single author. And they wrote this book about Earth, Mars, which became a big military power. Earth is kind of destroyed. The environment's destroyed. The people are depressed. And then you have the Belters. And the Belters were a group of people sent up for opportunity to mine the belt. And the belt are just an asteroid belt that's filled with rocks. And when you mine them, and I think this is true, we will find things we never imagined, rare minerals in amounts we couldn't even begin to think of out in the belt. But all three of these groups have been separated from Earth for so long that they even have differences. The belters can't live on Earth anymore without help from medicine because the atmosphere is different. Mars is a very brutal, tough military group, survival at all costs, and Earth is just limping along trying to get going. The president of Earth includes someone who's very human but politically ruthless, Ava Sarala. I hope I said her name right, but she tries very hard to keep everything in balance. I think she doesn't want anything any way to go. So they're at this very tense place within the universe. And there's an element out there that does weird things to people. It's almost like um, a little bit like Last of Us with this weird fungal evolution thing. And someone discovered it and intends to use it for destruction. It's a weaponized biological weapon. So now we have this other thing that got let loose in there that is a threat to all of humanity. This gets loose on different planets. If it gets loose in different space stations, the the whole space station's lost. And that's what happens because it was the Belters who had this piece and they let it loose on one of the ships. And it is the weirdest thing you'll ever read in a book or see on a TV show. So now this very touchy situation erupts because of this finding. But then, because of this molecule that they have, it leads them to know that there are other aliens out there and they have a super transportation system. And so now there's a rush to go farther out. So in this case, when I said Battlestar Galactica was filled with good intention people who are all probably a little bit right, I don't think anyone in The Expanse is entirely right. But the show takes place from a group of a small ship of some good-hearted people who are just trying to do the best for themselves. It's a coalition of almost all the different parties. And while they each have their own interests and the interests of their hometowns, their home planets to look out for, they still want something else than the mutual destruction of all the places. So that is another place where we look at a terrible situation like Battlestar Galactica, where everyone maybe doesn't have the best interest at heart of anyone else but themselves. The third book is that shows kind of this comparison of leaders is Ender's Game. Also a movie, pretty good movie, a big series of books by Orson Scott Card. And this takes place of basically these aliens that are trying to destroy Earth. And Ender, 
is this very talented young boy who has the ability to save humanity. And what they do is put him through something, and I don't want to spoil the book, but that shows his leadership. He has the viewpoint of a little boy, but so smart. And as his view shifts about who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, using his knowledge, at first his trust. He was trusting that people were telling him the truth. But are they? This is where Ender's Game is a manipulation on every side. And so there are some good people trying to do the good thing, but nobody knows the whole story. So Ender's Game is also a good series about leadership when you don't know what the heck is going on or who to trust. It's a little bit like Dune even, where you get sent to this planet and everything revolves around group identity. Same thing with Ender's Game. Everyone has a group, everyone's being told something, and for the most part, no one is being told the entire truth about what's going on. If you ever do read Dune, it was a book that was written way back, and a whole series, so there's a whole bunch of these books, but there is a magic spice that allows you to transport yourself through the galaxy rapidly. So think about this, the spice is actually oil. Oil was giving us a method of transportation to the people who controlled oil. That's the same thing with the spice. So in the case of Dune and Ender's Game, it's all about our heroes trying to figure out what is really going on so I know what the right thing to do is. Ender has his army of kids that are champions, and they're going to fight whatever is coming their way. Same thing in Dune. You're trying to figure out who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, and become true leaders in a situation once you figure out what in the world is going on. In Ender's Game, the leadership, first of all, ha has to build a team. He gets a group of kids together on the same page so that they can work together as one. And they were not working together. That is why things weren't going very well for earth at all. But Ender figures out, as a boy, how to get people together into an identity. He delegates. He takes each of the valuable skills the kids have, even the ones that get made fun of, and uses them the best way they can be used. But he learns to trust them, and they trust him because he sees them clearly. He created a culture. He created a system in place so that kids would learn to trust each other. At first, you know, these were boys, right? These were just a bunch of boys who do stupid things to each other, like beating each other up, and learns how to be a leader in the best way he can. He becomes a champion for everybody, and he becomes a great leader by learning. It's not that he knows exactly what to do. He learns as he goes, and he grows into that seat. And he uses that group leadership to turn them into a force that can save Earth. Each of those kids that were in that situation weren't well off mentally. They all had problems. They all had issues because they were brilliant. And in some way, the government thought that these would be interesting choices to see if they could fight the enemy in a successful way. And so they were all damaged in a way, but still Ender took leadership of those groups and healed the kids to turn them into individually great leaders, but also good fighters. He's someone who led by not being in the captain's chair, right? Not being someone who is away from it, but he also went to battle with his people, kind of that old school king who goes to battle right side by side with his people. And then later on, when he starts learning more about what's going on, he starts to figure out, hmm, what is going on here? And am I doing the right thing? When we talk about Dune too, that's where we have that situation where Paul Atreides, which is the hero of Dune, along with his sister and his mother, are trying to figure out what's going on. He comes from a very wealthy family. He never was touched by any of the politics that were going on. And he was just at the stage where he was being trained 
in the early movie of Dune, he was being trained by Patrick Stewart, who plays Picard. Later movie, he's trained by someone else. Both good movies. Well, the first one's a little weird. But anyway, you get the idea that he suddenly is thrown into full-blown politics of what's going on with his planet. Has no idea. So he also has to learn on the job, much like Ender had to learn on the job, and come up with values that represent everyone. And I think that's where it becomes important. His father had values, and his mother has values. And he was able then to say, we have to win this war once he figures out what's going on, but we also have to do so with values, with leadership, and getting people who work with him to trust him when they normally would not trust him because he was someone who came from off-planet. So those are some suggestions of science fiction and leadership. And again, the first two ones we did with Star Wars and Star Trek, those were more formal military outfits that you expected to have a structure like military. They knew how this went. They knew how it worked. But when you're talking about Battlestar Galactica, there is a military structure, but we have to think of the civilians. When it comes to the expanse, it's a political mess. And the people who are trying to figure out not just survival, but who's right, who's wrong, and who's bringing this molecule into the system. And then with Ender and Paul Atreides from Dune, we're trying to figure out what the heck is going on at all. All great stories about leadership and science fiction, which you know I love. So my challenge to you is think about a book that you read and you think leadership plays a huge part in this book. What's to be learned by the character who's playing the main leader? And what can we take away to make our own leadership a little bit better? If you want, you can let me know what book you thought of. You can email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com and let me know what you think. You can also find me on Twitter. Both links are in the show notes. And remember that surviving this dangerous universe in all science fiction shows starts with small steps, although you might need gravity boots too. 